At Life Decisions, we are all about equipping people and creating opportunities. This campaign is just that. It's an opportunity for you to come alongside and join us in the work that we are doing. We appreciate all your support and would love to have you join the tribe and create a personal fundraiser with us today. Imagine a Rockford where every person is seen, known, and valued. At-risk youth are no longer leading our streets destructively, but they're empowered and inspired through relational mentoring. Serving together, barriers are broken down. New relationships are built. Imagine a tribe of mentors grows into a community of life-on-life -life relationships, together bringing restoration to Rockford. If you have any questions or would like to talk with any of us or meet the rest of the team will be back in the cafe after the service. Thank you all. Thank you, Jake and team. So I would definitely encourage you to, um, to number one, obviously pray for them. Uh, number two, continue to investigate. Number three, I would encourage you to give uh, financially to this work. So they're one-third of the way there. And then uh, number four, ask about, hey, how can I be involved in what uh, they're doing? So again, this is one of our partnerships right here in Rockford, filling a gap that is necessary. And I'm grateful for the response of those who are leading that team to make a difference where we live and you and I can be a part of that so I encourage you to get connected. Okay, we are now ready to jump into the Word. So here we go. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Proverbs chapter 3 and we're going to conquer a look at the first 12 verses or so this morning. So I am grateful, and I hope you are grateful as well, that God in his goodness and his grace provides us with his wisdom as to how we are to live our lives during our time here on earth. God did not just set things up and then go take a very long vacation, but he continues to be involved in his creation, continuing as a good parent to provide his wisdom, to provide his strength, to provide his support to each and every one of us. And my prayer, our prayer is that we would have ears that would hear what our good father would instruct us. And so it is up to us whether we're going to choose to follow the God of the universe, advice and counsel and wisdom towards us, or we can choose to follow our own path and go our own way. So my heart this morning is that all of us would hear from God and then we would put into practice, into our mind, and live out at least one of the principles we're going to talk about. Now, we're going to look at six different promises and principles, or principles and promises. And each one of these, believe me, could be a sermon unto itself. And so when we look at this section, you're going to see the if-then statements. These are conditional promises. God, number one, offering us his wisdom and saying, if you do this. And then with that principle, he connects to it in the next verse, a promise saying, then these things will be added to your life. So it is a series of conditional promises that is given to us that we either adopt or ignore. And again, I want to encourage you to at least this morning gravitate towards one of these couplings, okay? And I would encourage you to memorize those verses, meditate on those verses, and implement those verses in your life. Start with just one. And then when you get that one into place, I want to encourage you to continue in. And so as we go through these, and we'll go through them fairly quickly, I want you to highlight, and there are notes available for you in the back if you haven't grabbed them, or online, you can pull them up on your notes or from your computer if you're joining us at home. And just highlight this one is what I'm going to focus in on or these ones are I'm going to focus in on. And then again, put it into practice because it's not just hearing the word that matters, but it's important, but it's coupling with the word that knowledge with the transformation that is doing the word and putting it in our heart. Okay, so that's where we're going this morning. And then, by the way, 
next week, if you remember, we're going to have a combined service with our 10 o'clock and our 1 o'clock. We're all going to be here together because it's 4th of July, okay? And so we're going to be in here, and I think we'll all fit in here. We'll have to see. We'll have overflow downstairs. And so please be at that service, combined worship. It'll be a good time around the Word and around communion. And then afterwards... We're going for a picnic, okay? And so please just say, hey, I'm going to be there. It's going to be fun and games and food and connection with both sides of our congregation to be together. So make sure, make it a point, if you are in town, I know people travel on the 4th, to be a part of that service next week. Okay, so let's take a look at these. And again, there's a number of these. First, we're going to look at a principle, and then we're going to look at the promise. And we're going to look at six different ones of these. And please just look, say, God, what are you saying? to me, okay? So here is the first couplet that we run into. This is Proverbs chapter 3, starting with verse 1. It starts this way. My son, my daughter, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. We're going to pause right there. So don't you love how the Lord addresses us as children? He doesn't say, my dear servants or my slaves, but addresses us as sons and daughters. And this as a good parent who loves us and is for us and wants the best for us. The one who has suffered and sacrificed and given of himself to us. That is God's heart. And those of us who have children, we love them, and we want what is good for them, and we hope that they would listen to our hard-won advice. And we desire for them what is good and right and helpful. So God is not saying to us, do this because I say so. He is saying these things to us. He's saying, do this because it will help. You. So this is a good father telling us to remember his teaching. Do not forget my teaching. Why does he have to tell us this? Because we are prone to forget. Have any of you ever forgotten anything? Have any of you ever forgotten anything of great importance? Yes. I can't remember. That's that's very clever, right? I can't remember. Yes, I have forgotten, um, uh, let's see, wedding proofs on the top of my car and dr- driven away. I've forgotten to pick up a child and left by myself, right? We are prone to forget. And so first out of the chute, he says, hey, hey, remember, do not forget. This is one of the reasons why we come to church. This is one of the reasons why we continually read the Word of God. Because we are prone to forget. And so it takes intentionality, it takes focus to bring back to mind, re-put in memory, remember the things that are important to us. So, my son, do not forget my teaching. And what we're to remind ourselves of is God's teaching. And we, and we should be grateful for this teaching. And so we're putting it into our mind. Do not forget my teaching. And scripture tells us to put it in various places and to places and to remind our children and to meditate upon the word of the Lord. And then it goes from the head information Dropping down to the heart, okay? And let your heart keep my commandments. As it were, treasure them. Have it drop from things you know to things you believe, things that you hold on to, things that you protect, the values in which you put in your heart, and you cherish them, and you value them, and you live by them. So the point is to remember, remember, remember God's teaching and then to cherish them or keep them in our hearts as they're written on the tablet of our heart. That is the first principle that God tells us to do, okay? Remember my teachings, which you can do, and then let your heart keep 
my commandments. That's the principle. And then we see the promise in the next verse, which is connected to this. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So if we choose to hear God's teaching and to remember it and to focus in, in on it, if we choose to take his commands and put them in our heart, then God will stretch out our days. And in our days, he will fill it with peace. Don't you want peace, right? Not just peace in our world, not just peace outside of our door, but peace that is internal. Peace in our hearts. For it's not the days of life that matter most, but the life in the days. God says that if you put into your mind and you store in your heart, the length of days will be increased. And the depth of days will be stretched out. And into our days, he will add peace to us. Now, this does not mean that you're going to live to be 105, which some of you might do that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to live this long life. But each day will count, and he will stretch it out, and it will be peace to you. So this may be your principle this morning. This may be your promise this morning that you're going to say, I want to remind myself of your word. You're going to say, I'm choosing to treasure your wisdom in my heart. And God, I trust you that in each of my days you will stretch them out and fill my heart and fill my life with your peace. That is God's promise. Second, in the next verses, we run into the next principle of wisdom that God gives to us as sons and daughters. In verse 3, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. God instructs us to be a person who has steadfast love. This is a characteristic of God himself. And he does this, obviously, in in knowing his word, but giving us his Holy Spirit to change our character into his likeness. And so one of God's principle, if not the primary goal of his working in the world, is to conform us into the image of his Son. And so that in Christ we see God's characteristic because he is God in flesh. And one thing about Jesus, he had steadfast love even to the very end. And he was faithful, not just to his father, but he was faithful to his word and he was faithful to his family and he was faithful to his friends. This world needs more people who persevere in love. This world needs more people who are faithful to God, who are faithful to their word, who are faithful in good times, but more importantly, in bad times, who are consistently so. These type of people, People we can count on, we can trust, and God delights in. You can choose to be this way. Do not let steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Hold on to them. Remind yourself, as you would a necklace that you will see in the mirror, that you will be reminded, David, be faithful. David, have steadfast love. And write it again on the tablet of your heart. Not some poster on a wall, but something that is graved into the bedrock of your soul. I will have steadfast love. I will be faithful to your word and to my word. To my family and to my friends. 
And so if we adopt this principle, if we take this wisdom, there's a promise connected to it in verse 4. So you will find favor and good success in both the sight of God and the sight of mankind. This, I hope, is a desire of your heart, that you will find favor, that you will have good success. Failure, uh, failure, <laughs> favor in God's sight, that God sees their son and their daughter and is able to give us things because he knows that we love him and that knows that we'll be faithful to his instruction to us. And so he gives us things and precious assignments and precious people in sometimes difficult places because he trusts us. Why? Because in our heart is steadfast love. That when the going gives tough, we will continue to go. And we'll have favor from mankind, from our family, from our friends, from our employers, right? Right? I want us, when our employers think of us, and if you're the boss, that they would think of, you know what, I want Matt to be on the job. I want Brian to be on the job. I want Dave to be on the job. I want them, and I can give them things because I trust them. They are faithful. And because you've chosen to be faithful and chosen to have steadfast love, there will be favor and good success. If you want to be successful in anything, you have to keep going and you have to keep growing, both in the sight of God and the sight of man. Good wisdom, the principle of faithfulness, the principle of steadfast love and making it a part of who we are will grant us favor, good success in both God's eyes and in the community of people. Third principle we run into as these are coupled together. And these verses were ones that my mother made me memorize when I was a small boy. First and foremost, I memorized John 3.16, right? And most of us memorize. If you have not, I would encourage you to memorize that verse. And then the next thing that I was instructed to memorize was these verses. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord, right, with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. I am grateful that my mom made me memorize those words, especially in times in which I faced crossroads that would lead me drastically in different directions. Trust in the Lord, right, in all, with all your heart, right? Lean not on your own understanding. And I know when I did not take the advice of God, when I trusted in my own understanding, when I trusted in my own heart, right? And don't you like the advice that often we, we hear? Well, just trust your heart, right? I don't know about you, but my heart isn't that good all the time, right? Actually, it's, yeah, wild. It's wicked. It's depraved, right? If I trusted my own heart, uh, that wouldn't be so good, right? (laughs) So the advice is, hey, trust in the Lord. Which means, right, that you recognize that God's wisdom is better. God's wisdom is higher. Which means that we have a uh, a limited, finite understanding of the universe finite understanding of life, a small understanding of what goes on all around us. And so in trusting in the Lord with all of our heart, not leaning on our own understanding, and acknowledging Him, God, I acknowledge you in my life, and God, I want to live in a way that is most beneficial, that is showing the greatest honor to you, that leads to a place of your desire. If we choose to live this way, then this promise is ours. And He will make straight your paths. That's good wisdom in times in which we must discern what to do. 
and you have had plenty of those decisions, and you will face many of those decisions going forward. So I give to you the wisdom of God found in these verses. Are you trusting your own wisdom? Or are you seeking God? <laughs> Are you leaning on your own understanding, or are you acknowledging God? God, what would your word direct me towards? God, what in this gives you the greatest honor? God, how does these choices best align with how you have created me? In thinking through our choices with those criterion, God will help us and show you a straight way to go. Often the shortest distance between where you are and where he would want you to be. He didn't say an easy path, get that. He says a straight path. Because every pathway you choose will have challenges and pain to it. There's not one that is just easy and one that is just difficult 100%. Each one of them have some of these degrees. But it's not necessarily the journey, but the destination that matters. And so put these principles into practice and say, I'm going to memorize this. God, help me to do this. And God will help you in your decision-making process. Fourth principle we run into, and as this good father, as God gives us his wisdom, and promise, or principle and promise, principle and promise, principle and promise, we run into this one, number four. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Have we heard that before? <laughs> and turn away from evil. Being wise in your own eyes is another way of saying you are proud and you can trust in yourself and your own thinking. Being wise in your own eyes sees yourself as being the source of truth and wisdom. That your thinking is the standard. And this advice is given out in droves by our society. Just do what you want to do. Do what's best for you. Do what is right by you. Live your truth. The problem is that often our truth is not the same as God's truth. right? And ultimately, God's truth will reign and govern all things. And our good Father tells us not to be wise in our own eyes. Not to think that we have it all together and we know what to do. And granted, he will give us confidence to step out. But he says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord in the sense of recognize he has the final word in the end. And ultimately, his plans will prevail. And ultimately, he is sovereign of things. And we can either follow in his way or be broken on the trails of our own choices. And if we fear the Lord, and if we follow the Lord, it will turn us away from evil. The Lord will never lead you into doing evil. So if you are participating in some type of uh, activity that is um, different than the wisdom of God written in his word, you are not following the Lord. Period. Amen, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. It's there, right? It's there. In following the Lord, by default, we turn away from evil. So you cannot be pursuing the Lord and pursuing evil at the same time because they are different directions. You either pursue the Lord, and in so doing, by default, you're turning away from evil, or you're pursuing evil, and by default, you're turning away from the Lord. Okay. That's the direction. They're not parallel pathways. They're divergent. Okay. This is what he says, and I want you to memorize this. Right? This is, again, God's wisdom to you. It'll help you. 
No one can keep you from this but yourself. Do not be wise in your own eyes. God, help me. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil is the principle, the promise connected to it is this. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. And so recognizing God's wisdom is greater, recognizing that he is sovereign and just and holy and above all things and following him in so doing there is healing to our flesh, refreshment to our bones. And there are things that come to us because we live in a fallen society. And then there are choices that we make that drain our life, take our energy, and have a negative impact on our physical, mental, spiritual, emotional health. Here he is highlighting in our flesh. And sometimes our choices have negative effects on our bodies, right? Now I can't choose some disease, but I can choose if I decide to exercise which I'm doing a bad job of these days. I can choose what I participate in. I can choose what I put into my body. And if I'm saying, God, I want to honor you in everything, I want to fear you, I want to turn away from evil, our body will benefit. That I'm not participating in activities that would negatively affect my body be it what I put in or what I participate in, right? Following these principles will be healing to our flesh. Refreshment to your bones. The bones being the very center of yourself, where the marrow is, where life is, where the strength comes from. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Even physically, but emotionally and mentally. I don't know about you, There are times in which my strength level is at a zero. I can't go on. And in those times, and you have been there, some of you are there right now, it's time to say, God, I need your help. God, I need your strength. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need your help in your hand. Will you help me even in my physical body? Will you refresh me? God, give me your wisdom. Help me to turn from evil. These are good promises. These are good principles to us. And if you find yourself in this place, I commend you these verses. Next, we see another coupling, another pair. This is Proverbs chapter 3, then then verse 9 and 10. Here's the first principle. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce okay i'm not meddling here and your money i'm telling you what's in the word of the lord this is a principle right honor the lord now we can honor the lord in various ways we can honor him by 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 declaring that his name is holy And putting the name of Christ, the name of Jesus, above any other name. It's not just a name among others, it's a name above others. And so we can honor God in our time, and our attention, and our sacredness, and our efforts, and in our intentionalities. We can honor Him also in our money. If you want to tell where someone's priorities are, you can just take a look at their bank statement. And God is saying, listen, honor me with your money and with the leftovers of all you produce. Someone was paying attention. No. It doesn't say with the leftovers. And how often in our giving, we give God what's left versus giving God what's first. You see that honoring? 
right? Even in my time, I can honor my wife or I can honor my children by giving them what is best and making room for them up the top and to put that in first and then everything else comes upon, uh, onto it. Same true with our money. It says, honor God with your first fruits, which looks like when the paycheck comes in and you say, God, I'm going to give to you off the top, right? And then after I have put that money aside, then I will live on the remainder, be it 90% or be it it, um, less than that, 80% if you give more or whatever you give. And it's an honoring of God. God, I honor you with my wealth. I give you my first. I give you the best. And I trust you that the 90% or whatever that percent is will go farther than the 100%. And I'll tell you what, Right? We put this principle in our lives since we first married. Right? We will give to God this thing and trust Him for the rest. And you know, when you write that check first, it puts your focus in where it needs to be. Okay? I want to honor God with this amount, and then I want to honor God with all the rest amount. And I'll tell you that that part that is remaining will go much farther if you give to God first what, what in honor right, than all of it combined. And if you haven't tried that out, I would encourage you to do so. To honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits. Off the top, not after you pay for this. Right? You make room for it, saying, God, I want to honor you this way. And look at this promise. Verse 10. Then your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will be bursting with wine. This is a principle and it's a promise. And this is not a prosperity theology teaching that says we give to God so he'll give back. We give to God because we honor him. Right? That's why we give. And God is to be honored because in an honoring him he will bless you. Whether you're rich or poor doesn't matter. What matters is if you are honoring God. Be it with a penny or be it with a million. It's a reflection of our heart. That's why we give. And God, because he's good, say, hey, honor me and I will help you. I will honor you. And there's been plenty of times in our life and perhaps plenty of times in your life where the bank account was thin and the bills were fat. God, can you help? God, I don't know how we're going to do this. God, give us wisdom. And God has provided for us time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. So it's a challenge for each one of us because God does want to bless you in every way, including in your money. In order to do so, then it's honoring God first and trusting Him with the rest. And see and watch what God will do in this promise, in this principle, along with the others. Think about, pray about, put into practice Sixthly, and we're here, (laughs) the principle. Lastly, in this section for us, my son, my daughter, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his reproof. Now notice he starts with son and daughter in this first section. And then he ends with son and daughter. He says, listen to me, my son. Listen to me, my daughter. There will be times in which, as any good parent would, discipline their children. Not to destroy us, but to make us and to mature us and to help us. We know as parents, we do this to help our kids. Because we love them, we help them, and we correct them, and we show them the right paths. And God our Father continues to do this in our life. So when you are receiving the discipline or the correction of the Lord, don't despise Him for it. Don't be wary of His 
reproof and will see the promise. For the Lord, in verse 12, reproves him, reproves her whom he loves. As a father, the child, the son, the daughter, in whom he delights. So God disciplines those he delights in. It's a better thing to be disciplined by God in an area where we need correction than not to be. You are at a worse place as you continually are able to get away with this and this and this and this and this. And it seems all goes well for you and all is moving forward for you. I'm more scared for you in that place versus in a place where God draws you very close and says, nah. -uh. The tight leash of the Lord is a blessing because he loves us. And leash isn't the right thing, but the, but, but the, con, um, the connection. Okay? If you are convicted by God, be encouraged because he's delighting in you. Those that aren't convicted, those who continue to go from evil to evil to greater evil to greater evil, there will be a, a time of... of um, Reckoning. So God's saying, hey, if I'm coming alongside you and because I love you, I actually delight in you. I will discipline you, not because I want to destroy you, but because I want to make you. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. So you can embrace the discipline of God and recognizing that it is an expression of his love. And again, we as parents know that, but it's not something we enjoy. I did not enjoy disciplining our daughters. But the fruit of that is seen today because they are disciplined people. You understand this? So in a discipline, ask God, what are you doing in this? God, help me in this and help me to again be conformed into the image of your son. Again, as stated before, I want you to take time, all right? And if you haven't highlighted a coupling, I want you to do that. One or two, or perhaps three of these things, okay? I want you to take time to memorize the verses. Meditate upon them. And put into a practice at least one of the principles and promises. Again, all of these things are up to you. And we see in Christ, he followed these things, right? And no one but yourself can stop you from following these instructions. So again, I want you to look over the passages, look over the notes, and say, I choose this, or God, will you apply this to me? Test his principles and receive his promise. And be grateful that God gives us his wisdom. And may God give us words, and ears to hear. Let's pray together. God, we learned some good things about you today. That you are faithful. You are just. And because of Christ, we have a living hope. God, we're grateful that you indeed are a good, good father. And you Tell us you convey your wisdom. And God, help us to honor you by honoring what you say to us. Help us to not be hearers of the Lord, word, God, but we'd be doers of it. And God, we ask for grace, God, and we ask for restoration in ways that we haven't walked according to your principles. God, we're grateful that you continue your steadfast love to us, even speaking out to us this day. God, we're grateful that you didn't just um, bring us into this world and leave. But you are intimately involved, that you are surrounding us by your love, and you call to us to be with you and to learn from you. Jesus, we're, um, 
word. Eternally indebted, gracefully thankful, and deeply impacted by you. Thank you, Father, for bringing us into existence. Thank you, Father, for leading us by your word. Thank you, Father, for giving us your spirit. God, thank you, Father, for giving us companions in the body of Christ. Thank you, Father, for empowering us by your spirit. Thank you, Father, for the conviction and the grace and the help and the promise that you give to us. Help us as a congregation as you, and your church internationally to live these things out. We honor you for being good. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So we will conclude with a song, and then at the end of the service, there will be a couple here to pray for you. If you have any needs, uh, make sure that you connect with them. Pray with other people. We want to make sure that you are prayed for. And so be encouraged this day.